Hello, Tyson. Hi, Dimitri. Is the pronunciation okay? Okay, yeah, everything is fine. Yeah, finally, but I how, found the how, video. How do we pronounce your name? Dimitri is my name. Uh, just Dmitri. 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 Uh -huh. Yes, correct. I see. So, you are doing okay? Yeah, everything is fine. I'm ready to start. Yeah. <clears throat> I can try to share my screen. I see. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, why don't you try your screen? Let's do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And let's try to show the full screen mode. Let's go to full screen mode. <clears throat> Okay, can you see my full screen presentation? Is it full screen? Uh, yes, I can see your full screen. Yes. Full screen. Okay. So and uh, okay, so and I think the slide changed too. Okay, very very nice, very good. Uh, looks looks great. And uh, so, what time is it? No, it's exactly four in Seoul. Should be four. Yeah. Right. How about in, you? Are you in Russia? Yes, I'm in Russia. Uh, so but what is it Russian time? Exactly. Uh, time is 10 a.m. 10 a.m. Oh, 10 a.m. Okay, so not too bad. Mm. <clears throat> Quite convenient. Yeah. Mm. So mm -hmm. I saw that you has been, uh, you have been, you had been associated with Max Planck. Uh, yes, I worked for a quite short time in Max Planck Institute in group of Mikhail Yeremets, uh, uh -huh. something around one month or maybe one month and a half, something uh -huh. like that, maybe two months. I do not remember. It was 2016, as I remember, 2018. I see. Uh -huh. yeah. About and five years ago. I see. So now you are in, how do you pronounce, Skolkover Institute? Yeah, Skolkover Institute is fine. It's fine. I see. Sounds great. Okay, so I think right now <laughs> it is uh, four o'clock. So why don't we start the uh, the uh, uh, special seminar? And uh, let me briefly introduce uh, Dr. Dimitri Semanuk from Skolkova Institute of Science and Technology. <laughs> he is an expert in a uh, rising special field of hydride superconductivity under ultra high, pre ultra high pressures. And today, he's going to talk about synthesis and the superconducting properties of uh, magnesium, scandium, rubidium, and cesium uh, polyhydride under high pressure. Okay, let's welcome uh, Dimitri with a big hand. Dimitri, it's yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you for introduction. <laughs> um, so my name is Dmitry Semenok, and today we really will talk about um, synthesis and properties, superconducting pro properties of magnesium and scandium polyhydrides. I will mostly focus on experimental results, and I um, <clears throat> decided to make my presentation a little bit shorter because even discussion of magnesium and scandium uh, polyhydrides will take I think 40 minutes or even 50 minutes. So uh, a lot of people participated in this project. The complexity of the project is because uh, magnesium and scandium itself, they have quite low scattering rate, a quite low ability of scatter X-ray diffraction or X-ray radiation, I mean. And the problem is that only a few synchrotron in the world, <clears throat> it's mostly ECRF and IPS, can uh, give us sufficient uh, diffraction, sufficient diffraction to make uh, some, to draw some conclusions about the synthesized compounds. Okay, uh, Alex Zinchirov from IPS, from uh, United States, helped us to do the work with scandium hydrides. Uh, Katsuya Shimizu from uh, <coughs> Spring 8, Japan, from Moscow University, helped us with rubidium and uh, cesium polyhydrides. Ivan Trajan assembled uh, all the cells with magnesium and scandium, 
And uh, Andrei Sadakov helped uh, from uh, LPI, Lebedev Physical Institute in Moscow. He helped us to measure the transport properties. And uh, DJ Joe from Skoltech and from HP Star Beijing, she helped us to calculate a lot of properties of scandium and magnesium, uh, polyhydrates and other compounds. <clears throat> okay, um, so as I said, there is a huge problem uh, with light elements when you study it at uh, high pressure. Uh, to get the sufficient signal from uh, diffraction. And the uh, magnesium hydrogen system, we were able to study only at one source. It's uh, ID15B, high pressure diffraction beam line at ECRF in Grenoble, France. Uh, thanks to Mikhail Hanpland. <clears throat> Scandium hydrides, we tried to study at a uh, new synchrotron in Brazil. It's a um, serious synchrotron, but uh, we didn't succeed. And uh, successful results were uh, results were achieved only at HPCAT uh, at APS in the United States, thanks to Alex Gancherov. And cesium and rubidium hydrides were studied uh, at Spring 8 in Japan and at Elettra, synchrotron in Italy Express, because the atoms are much heavier, much bigger, and the scattering is much more effective. So it was much easier. <clears throat> In Moscow, our collaboration consists of three institute. It's a high pressure Moscow collaboration. It's a triangle in the south, southwest of Moscow. You can see this triangle and three uh, points. Maybe I can switch to uh, laser pointer. No, uh, yes, laser pointer, yes. <clears throat> so you can see these three institutes on the map of Moscow. The first institute is Skoltech. It's a this round building where we are doing mostly calculations. <clears throat> the second institute is a Lebedev Physical Institute <clears throat> where people, um, where we have a high pressure, uh, no, 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 where we have high temperature uh, superconducting research center, research center for high temperature superconductivity led by Vladimir Pudalov. And they help us to measure the transport properties of polyhydrates in diamond animal cells. And the last and most important point is Institute of Crystallography in Moscow, where Ivan Trajan load and heat most of the diamond animal cells for this project. Okay, Skoltech theory, Lebedev Physical Institute transport measurements, as I said, and the Crystallography Institute diamond animal cells and laser heating. <clears throat> okay, let me start from introduction, uh, where. I mostly will talk about the general, some general feature of polyhydrates and their high temperature superconductivity. Uh, within this presentation today, I will touch the magnesium polyhydrates. And one of the motivations for us to synthesize them, to use uh, magnesium as a, a starting material was prediction that magnesium should react with hydrogen at high pressure and form magnesium H6. It should be very good high temperature superconducting polyhydrate. According to the prediction made in 2015 by a group of Chinese rafters, <clears throat> the TC of this compound is even higher than room temperature. It's uh, up to 375 Kelvin. So it's very, very, very high, very, very good superconductor. And it was interesting to synthesize it actually. <clears throat> and uh, the first question, to the polyhydrides uh, under high pressure is what the maximum of the critical temperature of superconductivity we actually can reach when we compress it in a diamond anvil cell. Uh, that's interesting question still not completely resolved. But the second question, is it possible if we uh, achieve a room temperature superconductivity or just high temperature superconductivity in hydrides, is it possible to open diamond anvil cell release the pressure, maybe freeze the compound at liquid helium temperature, and after that use it without diamond anvil cell. It's a second interesting question. And the third, the most important for uh, experimental experimentalists, the third question is which elements to take to synthesize the best, uh, the best hydride superconductor? It's a very important question. Should we take yttrium and synthesize yttrium H10, or should we take magnesium and try magnesium H6, or some other elements, maybe two elements together, maybe take alloy and synthesize some lithium to magnesium H16, or so, so on. So that's three important questions I would like to address in introduction. And it's commonly accepted um, <clears throat> that superconductivity and polyhydrides 
actually comes from uh, electrophonon interaction. It's a phonon-mediated superconductivity, and it can be described within so-called baden cooper schiffer migdal eliasberg theory. Uh, on the level of DFT, we can calculate the phonon dose for hydride or for compound. Uh, using this phonon density of states, we can go to so-called Eliasberg function, A squared F. And within this theory, with this, uh, within this classical theory, there are only two important parameters for us. It is uh, so-called uh, electron phonon interaction strength, lambda. And the second parameter is characteristic frequency. Let's take, for example, a uh, logarithmic frequency. So you see two formulas. When we know two of these parameters, in principle, it's quite easy to estimate a uh, critical temperature superconduct. You can do it using the Allen Dines classical formula derived in 1975 for um, strong electron phonon coupling. Or you can use a modern formulas derived by uh, CA, uh, CA and co-actors and published in NPG computational materials in this year. Uh, those authors used uh, machine learning and uh, statistical data for um, solutions of Eliasberg equations and the data for already discovered hydrides in order to derive new formulas, more effective. And uh, those formulas can describe superconductivity in polyhydrides with better accuracy than original Allen Dines equations and formulas. So when we know lambda and lo logarithmic frequency, characteristic frequency, we can calculate TC. This is the most important uh, for experimentalists, uh, the most important fact for experimentalists, which comes from uh, baden cooper schiffer migdal eliasberg theory. Let's go. Uh, next picture I would like to show, it's a statistical analysis of the dependence of one of these parameters on pressure. Let's take this characteristic frequency, logarithmic frequency, and see uh, what we have now, and uh, how does it depend on pressure? That's a question. <clears throat> uh, here, the triangles, squares, circles, crosses, you see the different, different hydrides. I just collected a lot of data from calculations and from experiment and put it on one uh, diagram here. On the X, you can see the pressure on the why you can see the omega log, this characteristic frequency, um, characteristic phonon uh, frequency in the material, let's say that. <clears throat> you can see that there is a quite clear trend. When we increase pressure, the logarithmic frequency for material is actually increases. And um, let's, let's assume quite simple formula that we can uh, predict approximately, or maybe estimate, let's say, estimate this characteristic frequency, one important parameter, uh, to get the critical temperature of superconductivity using this sim very simple, very simple linear formula where the pressure is P in GPA and the coefficients here are in Kelvins, in Kelvin 390. It's approximately something average that we can expect for metals at uh, zero pressure if we exclude beryllium, for example. Beryllium has extremely high logarithmic frequency, but for uh, other metals, uh, average value is close to 200, 300 uh, Kelvin. So in this, in this uh, trend, I, I took higher value, close to 400 Kelvin. Okay. And now I would like to discuss a recently published a paper uh, published in Physical Review B, which is called Breakdown of the migdal eliasberg theory and the theory of lattice fermionic superfluidity. It was published was done by two actors. It's uh, Emil uh, Yusbashian and Boris Altschuler. Boris Altschuler is a very famous uh, theorist. Uh, he uh, got a lot of uh, famous awards, such as uh, Lars Ansager Prize, Dirac Medal, and uh, Europhysics Prize. And mostly he worked in the field of condensed matter. <clears throat> they analyzed Migdalia Eliasberg theory and found very interesting thing that superconducting state, in principle, within this theory, is thermodynamically unstable when the <coughs> electron phonon interaction coefficient exceeds value of 3.7, which is upper limit. So it's impossible to find the superconducting material with classical electron phonon interaction with lambda, with this electron phonon interaction strength, higher than 3.7, but typical value, actually, 3 because we do not know 
any materials or metals, superconductors or metals, uh, where this electron phonon interaction parameter is above three. Lanthanum H10 has about three, and uh, lead uh, Vismuth alloys, they also have 2.7 close to three. But we do not know any materials uh, with lambda, let's say 3.5, 3.3, 3.6, or some, something like that. So it's a really upper limit. Okay, so now we have information on the previous slide. I showed you uh, some data for first parameter. It's a logarithmic frequency. And now I showed you the maximum possible value of lambda. <clears throat> it's a second parameter. And now we can go back to the uh, formula, to the formula that I showed here. This is it. Now we can predict what is the maximum possible critical temperature in materials, in any materials within the Migdal-Eliasberg theory. <clears throat> but before, there is a short slide about simple application of this theoretical result that I discussed uh, one minute ago about this paper of uh, Yus Bashian and Boris Altschul. <clears throat> we can look at a very famous publication, let's say, uh, publication about lithium-magnesium H16. It was predicted by... Um, a group of Chinese uh, actors that this compound should be a uh, room temperature superconductor with extremely high critical temperature up to 475, as I remember, 470. At not so big pressure, 250 GP. Uh, but the problem is that in their publication, they showed that the, their electron phonon interaction coefficient is 4. And at a little bit higher pressure, 300 GPA, is also 3.7, which is very close <clears throat> or even exceed the maximum possible lambda within the uh, Migdal-Lashberg theory. So in fact, we should say no, and uh, we, should, we should not trust this paper, because definitely the main results for 250 GPA and for 300 GPA exceeds maximum possible uh, value of electron phenom interaction coefficient. And this is the simplest application. We can analyze a lot of data that's already published and see if the lambda coefficient, the electron phenom coupling coefficient exceeds the maximum possible value of 3.7. If it's so, we have a right, we have a reason to do not trust this result and go further. <clears throat> go further and maybe do not consider this compound as a uh, promising candidate for room temperature superconductivity. <clears throat> okay, now it's my last slide in the introduction. Um, almost like last slide, yeah. And I would like to combine two results. So this is logarithmic dependence of, uh, this is dependence of logarithmic frequency on the pressure. It's a just simple linear function. And I would like to combine it with maximum possible lambda within the uh, Migdal-Leashberg theory. You see left, and right picture. We have uh, several models. We have a Macmillan equation, original, Allen Dines formula for TC. We have uh, uh, formulas derived recently in 2022 using the machine learning and so on. And you can see that there is a very clear trend of maximum possible TC uh, dependence, uh, independence on, on pressure. We see that actually at low pressure, when we open the cells when we decrease, the maximum possible uh, TC decreases. So in principle, we cannot, <clears throat> we cannot find the room temperature superconductivity at low pressure in principle, because it requires lambda, which is much higher than theoretical limit for lambda within this middle Lashberg theory. But in order to find the room temperature superconductor, we should go higher. We should go to 200, 300 GPA. And this is, uh, this is true for all models, actually. All models with unharmonic correction, with lambda-3, with lambda-3-7, shows that we need to go to high pressure. And this is important thing. <clears throat> and uh, again, let me return to the, um, to the question, which, which useful lesson we can learn uh, from the recently retracted ethical room temperature superconductivity in carbonaceous sulfur hydride. We all know this famous result, which was retracted from nature, from cover of nature with 570 uh, citations already, and it was retracted. Uh, I think, I don't know, was it 
um, <clears throat> was it true what exactly the authors of these papers observed in their uh, in their experiment? But the fact is, the idea in principle is correct. They found some interesting phenomena, maybe superconductivity, maybe something else. In the previous, in the in the in the um, in the pressure range above 200 GP, in the pressure range from 200 to 300 GP, and I think, and I completely agree with the authors that this region is the most promising for room temperature superconductivity in polyhydrides. Okay, so, okay, yeah, magnesium hydrides. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> this is. Uh, first chapter of my presentation, the second chapter will be about scandium hydrides, but let's talk about firstly magnesium hydrides. <clears throat> I will start from uh, publications about this system, this magnesium uh, hydrogen system. And uh, uh, let's see, um, let's look at the paper published in uh, Material Research X Express in 2022. Uh, here the uh, team from Africa, team of characters, predicted that magnesium H4 actually should be a good superconductor and should exist at pressure around 200 GP. Okay, the same, the same team of actors also predicted that magnesium H3 uh, tetragonal or hexagonal also should be very good superconductor and hexagonal can be even room temperature superconductor. Uh, at 300 GP, but here for magnesium H3, we see the pressure range is very um, easy to be uh, to be realized in experiments, 150, 180 GP, so very easy to test. Oh, soon we will see the, our experimental results. And last paper I would like to show is a prediction in 2000, made in 2013 by a group of Yeva Zurek. They published a paper in Physical Review B and predicted formation of magnesium H12 at low pressure, relatively low pressure, 140 GPA, good superconductor. Magnesium H4 at 100 GPA, also not bad superconductor. And the magnesium H16 molecular structure at 300 GPA, also good superconductor. Okay, so uh, we can conclude that Different actors predicted formation of various compounds in magnesium hydrogen system, including magnesium H4, magnesium H3, and higher hydrides, magnesium H12, and magnesium H16, with quite pronounced superconducting properties. And we decided to synthesize it, to synthesize, to test how the, uh, maybe we can confirm it, maybe we can find uh, another compounds. Uh, we loaded a piece of magnesium with ammonium borane, in the diamond anvil cell with about 50 micron anvils, culet. Anvils were protected by a layer, nanometer layer of aluminum oxide in order to um, use multiple laser heating to protect the diamonds against the hydrogen. And magnesium particle before loading was pre-compressed to decrease its thickness to about one micron. It's important to um, create excess of hydrogen. And we use a composite gasket consists of calcium fluoride and epoxy and steel. This composite gasket, you can see it on the picture on the inset here, because um, in this picture I showed just Raman spectra. After laser heating, we see the formation and emission of hydrogen from uh, during decomposition of ammonium boron at low at high pressure. So the pressure was about 100, um, should be 80, yes, 180, 85. And after laser heating, the hydrogen was generated. So we took this cell to synchrotron and checked what is the structure of magnesium uh, sublattice in this hydride. Okay, there are several patterns we detected. Uh, as I told, the magnesium is very complex because the signal, uh, signal will be very, very low level of signal and uh, user for diffraction signal and uh, a lot of noise. But in the pattern number one, we clearly can see formation magnesium H2 with hexagonal structure. It's a known compound. And the volume of this, uh, of this unicell volume is close to theoretically predicted, not very far from theoretically predicted value. We also can see additional peak in diffraction pattern at much lower uh, diffraction angles, which corresponds to unknown at this moment higher magnesium polyhydride. I will um, 
maybe add some more information about this later. I will, I will tell it, I will discuss it later. And we also can see probably BCC magnesium, pure magnesium, but it's only pattern number one. In the pattern number two, in a different place of sample, at a little bit lower pressures, um, <clears throat> uh, we detected two phases. We detected a quite clear diffraction pattern with two phases. So those two phases are the main product of the reaction of magnesium with hydrogen. It's a cubic uh, FM3M type structures with hydrogen content close to magnesium H3 and close to magnesium H5. <clears throat> and those phases are separated because in the different places of sample, we saw that one phase is completely, almost completely disappears. So we are sure that this is, those are two different compounds, two different compounds. And the simplest, simplest explanation that those two compounds are cubic, ideal, magnesium H5, prototype is beryllium-5, uh, aurum, beryllium-5 gold, and the predicted cubic magnesium H3, FM3 magnesium H3 prototype is yttrium H3. So those were, were uh, the simplest explanation, the, the first, our proposal, the first, our idea. The problem is that both of those compounds are atomic, should be high temperature superconductors, and they have a volume, unit cell volume, uh, much smaller than the experimental volume we detected in our, uh, <clears throat> uh, we extracted from uh, diffraction data. <clears throat> you can see on the left side of this slide, uh, the data, numerical data, just <clears throat> maybe for other people who want to test, who want to try it and confirm our results. I collected, um, Unicell parameter for this cubic sublattice and their volumes for magnesium H5, magnesium H3, and for hexagonal magnesium H2, and uh, for BCC magnesium, and place it on this diagram with um, predicted equation of states for various magnesium polyhydrate. <clears throat> you can see that there is a significant discrepancy ex actually between the experimental data and theoretical data. And uh, it means that all of those, actually, all of those obtained magnesium hydrides are non-stoichiometric compounds. We always need to add some additional hydrogen to explain why the experimental volume is higher than theoretically predicted. For magnesium H5, it's about 0 0.5. Additional uh, half of hydrogen atom should be added. For magnesium H3, it's actually much bigger. It's much closer to magnesium H4, according to theory. Magnesium H2 has lower volume. I'm not completely understand why is it so, but <laughs> I just show the experimental results I have. And magnesium free, it's different places, a little bit different pressure. So that's why, and different quality of uh, X-ray diffraction data. But I think the average value is more or less close to the theoretical prediction, theoretical, the, theoretical prediction for uh, BCC mag magnesium. Okay. And we tried to explain it in different manner. We tried to recalculate to get again the um, theoretical uh, convex hole. Uh, we used USPEX calculations and we extended the calculations to bigger uh, unit cells with number of atoms up to 100 atoms of magnesium and hydrogen together. We found a lot of uh, other compounds with non-stoichiometric composition, which lie close to the convex hole, especially uh, when we uh, exclude dynamically unstable compounds. And one of the candidates is magnesium 8H25, which has a, um, which is stable, dynamically stable. This is a phonon density of states for this compound at 170 GP. And the structure is different, but X-ray diffraction pattern is the same. It's still cubic, cubic diffraction pattern. Uh, <clears throat> Another thing I would like to point out here is presents on the convex hole a lot of magnesium phases with high hydrogen content. You can see it on the um, right part of my slide. It's an upper, uh, upper convex hole here. It's ma marked by red uh, ellipse, red ellipse here. Uh, it's important to note. <clears throat> and um, here, I, I again, I just explained that the uh, diffraction pattern we observed by two phases, two cubic phases. I showed that by a red line, you can see the first cubic phases, and it's 
perfectly agrees with experimental data. And the second is blue magnesium H5. You see it's also quite nice, describes the uh, observed diffraction pattern. Uh, but in some other points, we saw uh, something I cannot explain right now. You can see on these two, I, I didn't analyze it in details because the uh, uh, data is quite noisy. But you can see that in some cases, there are diffraction peaks at low angles, at eight to theta and even at six to theta, which means that in the reaction mixture, mm, <clears throat> it's possible that we have a higher magnesium hydrides with hydrogen content 10 or maybe 12 in the reaction mixture. I need to reanalyze this data and maybe uh, look <clears throat> look at them again to see and uh, compare it with experimental or with theoretical predictions, because it seems like it's possible to explain those peaks by magnesium H12. Magnesium H12, it's a tetragonal structure. And again, I would like to point out this region of convex hull where we see a lot of structures, stable structures with high hydrogen contact. So it's possible that those two patterns or a few patterns, maybe three, four, uh, five patterns, exactly corresponds to higher magnesium hydrides, probably molecular hydrides, which do not have superconducting properties, but uh, have quite high hydrogen content. So it's a, it's a, some future, future plans of our research uh, in the field of magnesium hydrides. Okay, so I pointed out. <clears throat> and finally, uh, recently we measured uh, how those uh, magnesium hydrides um, behave, I mean, how the resistivity of this, uh, resistance of this magnesium hydrides behave under high pressure. So at 190 GP, you see that behavior is completely metallic and down to 18 kelvins, there are no signs of superconductivity in those compounds. Absolutely no signs. Only at around 18 kelvins, we see some drop, partial drop of resistance. It doesn't, uh, <clears throat> It's not a proof of superconductivity, but it's like a tip. Like we need to pay more attention to this field. So it means that probably uh, all of the hydrides I discussed, it's a magnesium H3, magnesium H5, and the higher hydrides, they all have molecular structure. They are not atomic. That's why they do not demonstrate any superconducting properties, any pronounced superconducting properties. We do not see any, um, any deviation from... Uh, block grunizing uh block grunizing uh curvature or block grunizing uh, equation in this uh dependence of electrical resistance on temperature here maybe this partial drop corresponds to the superconductivity in magnesium h2 maybe but again according to theoretical prediction it should have much higher logarithmic frequency but experimental uh debye temperature and logarithmic frequency almost two times lower almost two times lower. So that's why I'm not sure that this is magnesium H2, but we need to think about it, think about it more. <laughs> okay, so um, what, what, what do we plan to do? What we plan to do? Uh, we plan to, to repeat the synthesis and electrical resistivity uh, study uh, of magnesium hydride at higher pressure, because at higher pressure, we expect that molecular uh, hydrogen sublattice Will transform to will transform to atomic hydrogen sublattice, and we have a chance to see superconductivity. Uh, I would like to point out again that there is a large discrepancy between the cell parameters, X-ray diffraction patterns, and superconducting properties of the predicted atomic ma magnesium polyhydrides. In many papers, I showed you that it was predicted that even magnesium H3 should demonstrate TC over 100 kelvins, but in fact, we do not see anything like that. And the synthesized molecular, probably molecular and non-stochiometric magnesium polyhydride. In this work, uh, <clears throat> I would like to say that in this work, we have shown the formation of <clears throat> really perspective and interesting compounds. Magnesium reacts with hydrogen and form uh, magnesium H3 plus six, magnesium H5 plus six, and possibly higher magnesium hydrides such as magnesium H10, 12. Need to, additional, need to do additional experiment. Um, maybe we will be able to do it in 2023, 
at higher pressure and uh, we will try to confirm the formation of these compounds and maybe even um, we will get a new information about this higher magnesium polyhydrates. <clears throat> okay, uh, so I have, yeah. Uh, can I ask you a quick question? Yes, you can. Uh, yeah, in the one slide before you compare the theory and the, your work, and then, then you rejected the idea because the by temperature is too high compared with that predicted by theory, right? So right. my question <clears throat> is, uh, um, how did you obtain the by temperature in your experiment? Uh, I used the uh, block grunizing equation and uh, I just performed the feed using I this see. equation. And we I can see. extract the Dubai frequency. We used it many times in many experiments. And I would say with some certain mistake, let's say plus minus 100 degrees, this method works, really works for many, many hydrates and many materials. So I'm, I'm sure. How, how was the feeding quality? Like uh, when you fit it, you were Absolutely ideal, absolutely <laughs> ideal, because you see the curvature is no deviation, absolutely no deviation. So uh -huh. it's no problem to feed this curve. <clears throat> okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, scandium hydrides. Scandium is also very light element, also very complex to detect uh, structure of scandium hydrides. Uh, the only possible... Uh, the only one successful experiment was done at APS HP Cut uh, last year. Uh, Alex Gincherov performed this experiment and he succeeded. <clears throat> so let me firstly start from uh, publications uh, about the scandium hydrogen system. There are several publications already. It's not only one, <clears throat> but uh, no. For example, Yevat Zurich with Roald Hoffman uh, predicted the formation of a lot of scandium hydrides, it's a very rich system. And there is a scandium H3, 2, 1, 4, scandium H4, and a lot of higher polyhydrides such as scandium H6, 7, 8, 9, and 12, and, and probably even higher hydrides. So all of them actually are, most, most of them, most of them are good superconductors and the maximum TC is close to 160 kelvins, 160 kelvins. <clears throat> okay. So it's something we expect from theory. It's our expectations. And we decided to confirm, uh, to check these theoretical predictions and place a very small particle of scandium. It's this uh, black spot uh, on the diamond anvil, compress it to, it to about 180 GPA. You can see the Raman signal, completely clear. We can see only hydrogen after laser heating. It's here and no other signals, so no signals from ammonium boron, no signals from decomposition products of ammonium boron, except the diamond and second order diamond, we cannot see anything else. <clears throat> okay. And uh, we detected several patterns, several diffraction patterns. <clears throat> um, okay, let me, let me explain it. <clears throat> uh, the first of all, I would like to refer the previous uh, paper, it's a uh, Shao, and K afters investigated formation of scandium H3. Actually, scandium H3 exists even at uh, zero GPA. It's not a problem to synthesize it. But at high pressure, demonstrates some superconducting properties. And the uh, results, pictures published in an organic chemistry one year ago in 2021 shows that there is a one unexplained peak. It's on the picture B on the right side of my um, on my on my slide. There is a picture B and there is a I4 MMM, this sign, which shows one additional unexplained peak. And really, in our experiment, we also synthesize something, something with similar X-ray diffraction pattern. <clears throat> we can see this small peak here. And of course, the main product is a scandium H3. It's a big FM3M, this series uh, of strong FM3M-like uh, diffraction peaks, diffraction uh, uh, pattern and as impurity we synthesized uh, the compound which should be attributed to uh, tetragonal scandium H4 and this compound was missed in the interpretation of this uh, inorganic chemistry paper but when we repeated this uh, experiment with scandium we synthesized we got absolutely similar pattern and similar impurity here and actually it's very well can be explained by scandium H4 
It's a tetragonal structure similar to lanthanum H4, yttrium H4, and we were able to synthesize it. And cell parameters are very close to the predicted, theoretically predicted parameters at 170 GP. We see quite weak diffraction uh, uh, signals, diffraction reflections. It's a single, single crystal-like uh, diffraction reflections, only three maybe spots or something like that, just a few spots. But circle is quite strong. Circle is quite strong. When, they, when we look at the uh, image, diffraction image, image, we see that signal is quite, quite uh, obvious. So we think that we synthesized this tetragonal scandium H4. <clears throat> and the second pattern were much more interesting. <clears throat> the second pattern, uh, we detected new compound uh, with much higher hydrogen content than in this scandium H4. Okay, you can look at the picture C. Uh, we have uh, several diffraction uh, peaks at low uh, diffraction angle, low to theta. It's about 5.5, and next is 7.5, which is sh which shows us that the hydrogen content in this new compound is much higher than the hydrogen content in scandium H3, which is still main product of the reaction. And we can explain almost all diffraction peaks uh, observed an experiment using the hexagonal P6 MMM scandium H10 structure with those um, unit cell parameters, you can see it here, except uh, with two exceptions. One peak is still unexplained. I don't know how to explain it. And one peak is still missed. The rest peaks are more or less okay and uh, <clears throat> uh, more or less okay. And uh, we, can, we, can, we can state that the diffraction pattern is 90% of diffraction pattern is explained, is explained by this combination of those two phases. It's a scandium H3 and scandium H10. The hydrogen content we calculated by comparison with theoretically predicted uh, equation of state for scandium H10. You see, this is a hexagonal scandium H10, and uh, it's probably P63 MMC structure, and this is our structure. It's quite close, and approximately we can say that this is scandium H10. To do not make uh, uh, the field too complicated or this result too complicated, for simplicity, just uh, let's call it scandium H10. Uh, other compounds, scandium H4, as I told uh, <clears throat> you, uh, the volume of scandium H4 is, is in agreement with theoretical calculation. Volume of scandium H3 is also in very good agreement with theoretical calculation. So there are no problems with uh, determining the volume of scandium hydrides. But in fact, the electrical resistance measurements showed that above 80 Kelvin scandium hydrides do not exhibit superconducting properties. Right now, I cannot show the resistance dependence of electrical resistance on temperature, but I think should, I should get this data within maybe a few days, a few days, maybe, maybe one week. But in fact, we detected that above 80 Kelvin, we uh, cannot see any signs of superconducting transition and behavior is like in normal metal. So it means that this scandium H10 is probably also molecular hydride and we need to compress it more and reach 250 or maybe 300 GPA to turn it, to convert it to a uh, metallic superconductor with atomic hydrogen sublattice. Um, I also calculated uh, and checked, rechecked the literature data for superconductivity of lower scandium hydrides Scandium H, scandium H2, scandium H3 are not good superconductors, very bad superconductors, but scandium H4 should be good superconductor with TC about 70, 80 Kelvin. So we expect uh, to see some signs of superconducting transition when we cool our mixture down and below uh, liquid nitrogen temperature. Unfortunately, at this moment, we are limited by liquid nitrogen temperature, but it should be solved. This technical problem should be solved soon, and we can check uh, how this scandium sample, scandium H4, behaves behaves in the uh, at lower temperatures. So it's our plan. Okay, so again, for scandium, as for magnesium, we should repeat uh, the synthesis and uh, test, electrical tests, at pressure 250 GPA at least. Need higher pressure, lower uh, lower weight and a smaller the atomic radii, it means we need to apply more pressure to form superhydrides and to convert it to atomic super, uh, atomic hydrogen uh, superhydrides. <clears throat> uh, 
at this pressure above 180, 190 GPA, scandium hydrides are not superconductors above 80 kilowatts. Okay, the correspondence between theory and experiment in the case of scandium hydrides is much better than in case of magnesium hydrides, magnesium polyhydrides. It was predicted maybe seven or even nine years ago, nine years ago was predicted formation of scandium H3, scandium H4, and it was synthesized. Those compounds were synthesized and uh, formation of these compounds uh, was confirmed. Scandium H9 and scandium H12 were also predicted nine years ago. And finally, recently, we are uh, were able to synthesize scandium H10. And I think that accuracy plus minus one hydrogen is still uh, is still acceptable. So I think the prediction actually is quite accurate and we can consider it as a successful case of theoretical prediction of formation of higher scandium hydrides. Uh, and Yes, this prediction was confirmed in the experiment. <clears throat> yes, and we have shown the formation of two new uh, scandium polyhydrates. Again, again, it's a scandium H4 and scandium H10 with molecular, probably hydrogen sublattice and hexagonal uh, sublattice of scandium atoms. Okay, that's all. Almost all, and a few last slides, and I will finish my presentation. <clears throat> I would like to, again, advertise the applications, possible applications of uh, superconducting hydrides. Uh, it's my dream to develop such devices to realize an experiment because we can, for example, demonstrate how these polyhydrates can be used as a superconducting memory. We can place a lot of small particles of lanthanum, synthesize lanthanum hydrides, and uh, use them as a memory cells because we can uh, fix there and generate in these particles a trapped flux, magnetic flux, this rapid magnetic flux can be generated by external coil. It's a very well-developed technology. You already can see the photos of such coils on the uh, right side, right side of my uh, presentation of my slide. And uh, in principle, detection <clears throat> of those rapid magnetic flux can be done by squid detector or by a micro single a single turn coil. You can see on this picture on the left side uh, of my slide, you can see already uh, deposited such single turns. So in principle, all technologies we already developed just need to combine them together to realize this superconducting memory. And erasing of this memory can be done by laser because a local small heating will just kill this trapped magnetic flux, will kill all the currents, circulating currents in these microparticles of lanthanum. Um, a series of other applications. Uh, it's probably mostly it's a sensors. We can use a diamond and the cells with loaded uh, lanthanum hydride, yttrium hydride as a sensor. Sensors for optical measurements like single photon detectors. We can uh, realize the geometry of squid and try to detect the magnetic fields. It's also at the superconducting uh, transition superhydrates. We can use it as ultra sensitive thermometer, and as well we can create a, some kind of sandwich using the magnetic atoms such as niodymium, europium, samarium, and uh, non-magnetic atoms such as lanthanum create a sandwich from superhydrides, and this sandwich will be sensitive to magnetic field, and we can um, observe probably some spin-related phenomena in the superconductors, which is also very interesting from the theoretical point of view and experimental too. Yes, and final remark again, I would like to repeat that uh, in the future, when we will search for room temperature superconductors and polyhydrates, we need to go higher in pressure, which is uh, quite complex now, but I think we must go to this, uh, to this region from 200 to 300 GPA, because in this region we can at the same time with light elements, with light atoms, achieve high lambda, high electron phonon interaction coefficient, and high logarithmic frequency. And both of these factors should be high in order to get the room temperature superconductor. Yes, <laughs> and again, no, I just will repeat the theoretical results regarding magnesium hydrogen system are mostly wrong, but okay. <clears throat> At this point, I would like to stop my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, thank you for your patience. <clears throat> thank you, very nice talk. And uh, so I think uh, this talk is open to questions.